Okay, now, so again, according to Anna, um, who's stationary, who's now in the rest frame of the muon, the Earth is rushing towards her, and the object, this thick, the thickness of the atmosphere, looks smaller because of length contraction. And so um, the consequence of that is that the Earth's surface does, doesn't have as far to go uh, to, to uh, intercept a muon and for it therefore to be detected uh, in the two microseconds, roughly two microseconds uh, between the time that the muon is produced in the upper atmosphere and the time that it decays. And so this basically results in an increase in the flux uh, compared to the classical calculation. So these two different perspectives are equivalent. From the Anna's point of view, you have length contraction, the, the distance, the, um, the thickness of the atmosphere uh, is contracted, and so in a certain amount of time you don't have as far to go. From Bob's point of view, the time is dilated, so, uh, in a partic so you have more time to go a particular distance. Okay, now let's just take a, a brief minute here to discuss the specialness of special relativity. That is, why is it called special relativity instead of just relativity? Um, well, basically, this is to distinguish um, this theory from Einstein's general theory of relativity. Um, in Einstein's special theory of relativity, the predictions are only rigorously valid um, in certain very special situations. Strictly speaking, um, the special situation that uh, special relativity applies to is only if for freely falling reference frames. Those are that is those are reference frames that um, where the observer experiences no gravity. So situations that are okay, where where special relativity applies rigorously, uh, would be like a broken elevator where um, uh, you're freely falling. A space station in orbit, uh, the space station is orbiting the Earth, so its acceleration is um, towards the center of the Earth, which basically means it's also freely falling. Um, not situations that are not okay, the most obvious is basically standing on Earth. This is the, this is the one that we've been considering. Um, standing on Earth has two problems. First, it's not a freely falling reference frame. The other thing is that because the Earth is, is rotating on its axis, there, the centrifugal force is sort of like a negative gravitational effect and it sort of pushes outward. Um, that's the combination of gravity and that um, uh, are small and can often be neglected. And so a person standing on Earth uh, in most situations that we'll be interested in, it's a good approximation. We can safely neglect the Earth's gravitational field and special relativity um, will be relatively accurate. Now, Einstein's theory of general relativity, which is much more complex and we will not be discussing that in this class, maybe we'll give, be able to have time to have just a hint of it in several weeks. Uh, but uh, general relativity is valid even in strong gravitational fields and um, and it predicts additional non-intuitive effects that um, beyond those that are predicted by special relativity. One of the more interesting maybe is uh, the prediction that a strong gravitational field can actually bend the trajectory of light. So we usually think of light traveling in straight paths but if light enters a region of a strong gravitational field, such as one that might be uh, uh, surrounding uh, a massive galaxy, then um, you can get strong uh, bending of the light rays. So for example, if you have a quasar or some sort of um, you know, heavenly body that's behind a, um, a massive galaxy with respect to the Earth, normally that quasar would be hidden, but the light can actually, that's going in this direction, can actually bend around and actually reach Earth. And this will actually produce two different images of the quasar, top and bottom, and also, well, maybe four images, we in and out of the page as well. And this effect is predicted by general relativity and is actually useful for cosmologists.